আসসালামু আলাইকুম শুভ সন্ধ্যা বিডি ফিজিশিয়ানসের নিয়মিত আয়োজনে আবার চলে আসলাম আপনাদের সামনে আমি হৃদয়ের কথা বলিতে ব্যাকুল সুধাইল না কেহ হৃদয়ের কথা নিয়ে আজকে আমাদের আপনার আমরা আপনাদের সামনে চলে এসেছি আমাদের হৃদয় যখন কাঁদে হৃদয়কে পর্যাপ্ত পরিমাণ সাপ্লাই যখন আমরা দিতে না পারি হৃদয় ঠিক সময় সেই সময় কার যে কান্না এবং সেই কান্নাটাকে আমরা কিভাবে ম্যানেজ করব। সেই ম্যানেজমেন্ট নিয়ে আমাদের সামনে আজকে চলে আসছেন আমাদের সামনে একজন হৃদয় বিজ্ঞানী প্রিয় চিকিৎসক বিন্দু বিডি ফিজিশিয়ান আজকে আপনাদের সামনে নিয়ে এসেছে ম্যানেজমেন্ট অফ অ্যাকিউট মাইক্রোডিয়াল ইনফার্কশন আমরা অত্যন্ত আনন্দের সাথে আপনাদেরকে জানাচ্ছি আমাদের মাঝে আজকে স্পিকার হিসেবে উপস্থিত আছেন ডক্টর আজিজুল হক স্যার এমডি পিএইচডি কনসালটেন্ট ডিভিশন অফ কার্ডিওলজি এমর ইউনিভার্সিটি স্কুল অফ মেডিসিন ইউএসএ আমাদের আজকের এই সেশনটিকে চেয়ারপারসন হিসেবে আমাদের মাঝে আছেন ডক্টর যে আমাদের মাঝে আজকে চেয়ারপারসন হিসেবে উপস্থিত আছেন চৌধুরী এইচ আহসান স্যার ক্লিনিক্যাল প্রফেসর অফ মেডিসিন ডিরেক্টর কার্ডিয়া ক্যাথেটোরাইজেশন অ্যান্ড ইন্টারভেনশন ডিরেক্টর কার্ডিওভাসকুলার রিসার্চ ইউনিভার্সিটি মেডিকেল সেন্টার ইউএসএ প্রিয় চিকিৎসক বৃন্দ আমরা আমাদের আজকের স্পিকার সম্পর্কে যদি কিছু বলতে চাই আসলে অল্প কথায় স্যার সম্পর্কে বলে শেষ করা যাবে না স্যার কার্ডিওলজিতে পোস্ট গ্রাজুয়েট ট্রেনিং করেছেন পিএইচডি ইন কার্ডিওভাসকুলার রিসার্চ পোস্ট ডাক্টোরাল ফেলোশিপ ইন কার্ডিওভাসকুলার রিসার্চ বিভিন্ন ইউনিভার্সিটি থেকে করেছেন এছাড়াও স্যারের বিভিন্ন অনার এবং অ্যাওয়ার্ড আছে খুব অল্প কিছু যদি আমরা এর মধ্যে বলতে চাই এর মধ্যে আছে জিএ স্টেট সিনেট রিকগনিশন অফ টপ ডক্টরস অফ টু থাউজেন্ড টপ ডক্টর ইন অ্যাটলান্টা টু থাউজেন্ড সেভেন্টিন এইটিন অ্যান্ড নাইনটিন বাই অ্যাটলান্টা ম্যাগাজিন সিনিয়র ফিজিশিয়ান দি অ্যাওয়ার্ড ইন দি ক্লিনিক্যাল ডিস্টিংশন প্রোগ্রাম সোশ্যাল ইনোভেশন অ্যাওয়ার্ড টু ডিনস রিকগনিশন ফর বেস্ট পেশেন্ট স্যাটিসফ্যাকশন টু Department Recognition of Doctors Day in 2016, Hours of Excellence in the Management of Cardiac Patients with Heart Failure and Acute MI, Young Scientist Principal Award on Cardiovascular Research, Hypertension Summer School Award by World Hypertension League and European Society of Hypertension. HRO Sarbivino Society the membership RH, World Hypertension League, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology. আমরা এই অসাধারণ মানুষটির অসাধারণ প্রেজেন্টেশন আজকে উপভোগ করব আমি অনুরোধ করছি আমাদের চেয়ারপারসন স্যারকে আজকের এই প্রেজেন্টেশনটি শুরু করার জন্য গুড মর্নিং एवरीवन ইট ইজ এ ডিসটিংক্ট অনার এন্ড প্রিভিলেজ দ্যাট আই অ্যাম আস্ক টু প্রিসাইড ওভার দিস সেশন হুইচ ইজ ভেরি ক্লোজ এন্ড ডিয়ার টু মাই হার্ট আনলাইক মেনি অফ আস Uh, Dr. Azizul Haq, Aziz Bhai, is not a plumber <laughs> and he runs this cardiac care unit. He is involved in the patient care of uh, coronary artery disease, MI, and it is critical. It is critical that we have a perspective of the clinical presentations, management, and the, and the overview on this subject from, from someone who is not only uh, is well versed in the subject, but also involved in the clinical care and has a scientific mindset. Without further ado, I would request um, Dr. Adhijil Haq uh, to present um, acute MI recognition and management. Thank you very much, uh, dear president and distinguished panel and colleagues that you are listening to this lecture today. And it's an honor for me to be part of VD Physicians Group because I see how they are dedicated to educate our young physicians and to promote the future care, not only cardiology in different aspects of medicine. Today, I'm going to talk about acute ST elevation MI, recognition and management. So I don't have any disclosure, so I'll go directly to the talk. Uh, the learning objectives today from a clinician point of view, as Dr. Hassan mentioned to you, Dr. 
that I'm not an intervention cardiologist, I'm a clinician. And I focus on the more on the clinical part of that cardiac care. Definitely our learning objective today, that recognition of acute ST elevation in mind, how you're going to diagnose them, differential diagnosis of that, and how to recognize the ECG patterns of acute ST elevation MI. Once we diagnose that, how are we going to manage those myocardial infarction? And definitely as we go along, we have to review the data that we personally grew up, I personally grew up from 1980s uh, with all the trials and evidence-based data that we have, how we are incorporating those data in our medical management. So we know that when I was in medical school, when patient came with heart attack, we used to treat very conservatively. And those patients stay, stay in the hospital a week, sometimes two weeks, and, and we really offered them bed rest. And only thing we would offer sometimes prayer, really. But over the time, since the first use of streptokinase as a fibrinolytic therapy, the care of acute coronary syndrome has improved significantly. Now we have highly protocolized, systematic and expeditious processes that not only improve the therapy and it had tremendous impact in the quality and quantity of life. And as you know that despite that huge advancement in the acute care of the STEMI patients, and there's a huge difference between advanced industrialized nations and in how we treat those patients in developing countries. Because definitely in Bangladesh, like all our, and many developing countries, we are far behind in the acute care of MI patients on average. And definitely there's no real world data, registry level data of these patients to report this acute MI care how we are doing and how much progress we can make. And I did some review of uh, recent literature and information as much as you could get from Bangladesh. Uh, that a recent publication from 2020, Rafi et al., they showed that the significant pre-hospital delay of MI patients, that subsequently we know this is going to happen, that it will increase the inpatient in hospital mortality and definitely subsequent uh, long-term morbidity and mortality because the median delay was nine hours, nine hours to about 13 hours. That's a significant delay in acute MI. And we know that PCI is not widely available in Bangladesh. And definitely fibrinolytic therapy, if you look at it, streptokine is, is the best that we could afford in most hospitals but still not widely kept in-house for immediate use. That's an important point. They are not kept in-house for immediate use. And no national coordinated care system in place for STEMI patients. And definitely, as you mentioned, there's no MI registry to assess the efficacy and efficiency of the care. As a recent data that I found very interesting, one of our colleagues, Dr. Abzalur Rahman and his colleagues from NICVD, they have shown in the Austrian trial that if you keep streptokinase in-house and they did a randomized trial that uh, patients were treated with in-house streptokinase and the patients who bought streptokinase from outside of the hospital, we see there's a significant delay in mean door to injection time, 25 minutes versus 70 minutes. And as we expect, definitely they will have less ST segment resolution, 72% versus 61%. And as we see that subsequent outcome would be different that we expect that patients, when we had that in-house streptokinase, death was like 12% compared to 23% when they have to buy from outside of the hospital. That translated LV function, that's translated in cardiogenic shock, and that's not unexpected. So the concern is that despite that the streptokinase was discovered in 1933 and it was first used 
intercoronary infusion in 1979, we have moved tremendously forward since then. And that was a you know, life-changing medications in the acute care of patients of, after myocardial infarction. And the first trial, the GC trial, Gruppo Italiano trial in 1986 that was published that validated the use of fibrinolytic therapy the first time as an effective therapeutic method. But not only that, it also gives us fixed protocol how to use it in acute MI. And the reason I'm putting on streptokine is because it's still essential in a lot of developing countries and in Bangladesh particularly, that's the most available thrombolytic therapy still. And I'd like to share one slide that, you know, Dr. Andreas Grunzig, who first used and balloon angioplasty in 1977 in Zurich, Switzerland. He's a German, but he came to US in 1980s and he actually headed the international cardiology in Emory University School of Medicine. And then in 1987, first human use of coronary stent down in the USA in Emory University. As you know, we always have to look at the pathophysiology, what happens in acute MI, definitely it's thrombus formation. If it's totally occludes the artery, you get the ST elevation MI. If it's partially occludes, then, it, it, and if you have damage to the myocardium as evidenced by troponin, you can have non STEMI. If no troponin elevation, we call it unstable angina. The whole gamut of diseases, they fall into the category of acute coronary syndrome. We always have to look at the pathophysiology because all the treatments will come along that. And interestingly, uh, in cardiovascular medicine, all this data comes from pathophysiology and uh, clinical experimentation, trial data. So we have to focus on that and then we figure, and then we'll understand better what medications we have to use and when to use it. I'd like to play a video of plaque rupture mechanism. And you see that initial lipid accumulation happens and then the foam cells gets there, microphages gets there, then uh, it, and you see the rupture of the plaque. What happens here? So initially the lipid accumulation and then when the microphages go, it enters that, that area, it causes a lot of inflammatory process. A lot of proteolytic enzymes, metalloproteinase, they release that, they destroy those cells, they create necrotic cores inside. And this necrotic cores, uh, they are very important because that determines the vulnerability of the plaque. And it happens when the shear stress on both sides of the plaque is the most. So it gets uh, ruptured in that area. And when it ruptures, definitely a lot of cascade mechanism happens uh, when, when it uh, forms the uh, blood clot. And uh, not only we call it cellular mechanism, that also humoral mechanism happens. It, it starts platelet adhesion, aggregation, uh, sorry, platelet adhesion, activation, and aggregation. So that's very important part. And we need to understand this inflammatory process that happens inside the plaque that makes the plaque vulnerable. That's the reason we use nowadays a high dose of statin when the patient comes to the hospital with acute coronary syndrome or STEMI, and we give aspirin, definitely, along with other medications, we give high dose statin. And, and the data came from the MIRACLE trial, okay, and that published in 2001. And we see that when you give statin therapy on those patients versus not giving the statin therapy, we see that death, non-fatal MI, resuscitated cardiac arrest, worsening angina, and urgent rehospitalization, they are far better in the statin group. And this, and this difference we're seeing immediately, like after four weeks of therapy. And there's another trial came along, we call Prove It trial, the TME22, that you know, covered the you know, low intensity statin and high intensity statin. And we see in that group, then when patients received like 40 milligram of bravastatin compared to 80 milligram of atrovastatin, we see a difference in mortality benefit on these patients, both short-term and long-term. So 
why statin helps its main effect, not only the lipid lowering agent to lower the cholesterol, but its main effect also in acute setting, anti-inflammatory effect that makes those plaques less vulnerable so that, you know, and makes the endothelial function better. So a lot of other non-lipid dependent mechanisms, they favor these outcomes. So bottom line, when the patient comes with acute coronary syndrome and particularly STEMI, make sure along with other treatment, give high dose statin right away. And if you look at the pathophysiology of plated activation, aggregation and thrombus formation, and we, we, from this figure, we know what medication we use and why we use it. We use aspirin here, cyclooxygenase inhibitor, we use clopidogrel, prasugrel, ticagrel, or canglor, the P2Y12, because to prevent the ADP-mediated uh, GP2B3 activation. We do abseximab, apt-fibotide, or tyrofibin to act, inhibit that process to prevent platelet aggregation. So that there's different part we could use uh, this type of medication to inhibit this process of thrombus formation. And definitely fibrinolytic therapy comes along later on to degrade the fibrin. So this is the pathophysiology. Now let's look at that. What's initial assessment and triage when you see these patients? We understand that when you treat STEMI, time is muscle. So you have to be very quick and focused and prompt. So do a quick focused physical exam Make sure you get a ECG and they should go simultaneously. And you know that ECG needs to be interpreted within 10 minutes. You look at the chest pain, make sure you understand the location, onset, severity, radiation of the pain. And also at the same time, you need to be very careful to have some differential diagnosis in mind that you're not missing acute pulmonary embolism. You're not missing acute di aortic dissection acute pericarditis, esophageal rupture, or some acute abdominal process. And time starts, clock starts when the patient comes in contact with first medical professional. That's the clock starts, not the patient sitting in the ER still didn't see the doctor or nurse there. First medical professional contact, that's the clock starts in the STEMI treatment. Let's start with the case because I'm a clinician. I always love to analyze those cases and how we treat those patients. Patients with multiple risk factors for coronary artery disease presents to the ED with acute chest pain. Pain is severe. Patient reported that initially started at left side of the chest about half an hour ago. Then it went to radiated to his back. He's very uncomfortable. He's cold, clammy, sweaty. His pressure is 170 over 110. Pulse is 110. And oxygen level is still okay. And then ECG is done. Okay. And he got the aspirin. And after the ECG was done, it, uh, you saw something there. You started some nitroglycerin drip. All right. So let's look at the ECG. And you see, you see the ECG, that acute ST elevation definitely in inferior leads. But there's no question that, you know, there's an ST elevation there. But you are face the reality. Okay, the, you, you want to do a PCI. If you're thinking about doing a PCI, that is more than 120 minutes away. What are you going to do on this patient? You will start heparin drip, start to give 600 milligram of clopidogrel, give fibrinolytic therapy, either streptokinase or tenecteplase, or you do CT of chest. Normally I do interactive session, but since we have different format here, so let's, let me answer myself and go over this case. Let's go back on the case. Okay, the patients give you some important history. So make sure you don't miss the case because patients started having chest pain initially about half an hour earlier. The, when you asked more precisely, the patient tells the doctor, the, patient, the pain went to my neck and then went to my back. Now I'm feeling in my back and he's very uncomfortable. And the patient is sitting on 30 microgram of nitroglycerin, still no, no help. And look at that, the patient's presented blood pressure is very high. 
So what you need to do, make sure you don't miss the patient, okay? Miss the diagnosis. You examine the patient, check your pulse, and both hands, you see some discrepancy on the pulse. That gives a clue. Whether the patient's having aortic dissection. The reason being, you do not want to give any blood thinner anticoagulation to this patient, so you might kill the patient. Okay, so you decided that you have some questions about that when you examine the patients that there's a discrepancy in pulses. So the question right now in this situation, probably the best option quickly, since you have question about the diagnosis of acute MI, despite that ST elevation is there, would they need to do a CT of chest? You did that, and what do you see? There's an ascending aorta, there's a descending aorta, there's a big flap. That's actually a real patient of mine. So there's a huge uh, you know, dissection going on and type A dissection. And if you do look at the longitudinal view, you see that it goes all the way down. So you need to be careful in diagnosing the patient's acute MI because reason it comes with a lot of things. You need to give a lot of blood thinner to the patients. And if you would have given the blood thinner to this patient, it probably would have killed the patient. So differential diagnosis is very important when you evaluate the patient with acute chest pain. Let's see another example. I'm, if you look at the EKG, the patient, like young patients, 40 years old, had some upper respiratory infection a few days ago, now coming with chest pain. And you go to the ERs, and the patient already got the ECG, and they told you that patients in the ST elevation, they call you what to do with the patients. And you see the patient sitting down, uh, you know, leaning forward. And uh, you, you, when you examine the patient, you lay him down, he cannot lie down, he just sits up right away. That's a diagnosis there, you don't need the EKG. Any patient lies down, pain gets worse, and he sits up, pain gets better, you always think about something different, despite that ECG shows something, if, uh, you know, whether patients are having acute pericarditis. Look at the ECG, yes, the patient has ST elevation, Pretty, pretty prominent in inferior leads. Look at the lateral leads. But what's, what makes you strike on that ECG? Look at that PR depression, PR depression, PR depression. When you see any ST elevation with PR depression, we always think about acute pericarditis and another pathognomonic sign. Look at the AVR lead. PR upright, upsloping PR here, upsloping PR here. This combination, upsloping PR in AVR, and PR depression are the leads. This type of ST elevation, likelihood it is acute pericarditis. The reason I'm putting these two cases, in these two cases, we do not want to start them on heparin and definitely not fibrinolytic therapy, you're going to kill the patient because this pericarditis may turn into hemorrhagic pericarditis. So what are the ECG criteria for acute STEMI? Definitely ST elevation you have to look at so if it's less than 40 years of age, their criteria is different than it's more than 40 years of age because 2.5 millimeter ST elevation in V2 to V3 and other leads one millimeter and above 40 years of age, two millimeter instead of 2.5. But if they're women, they're different because in a woman, you remember they always present with some atypical symptoms. You need to be extra careful on these patients. So their criteria is 1.5 millimeter in V2 to V3 and one millimeter in all other leads. So let's look at some few examples of ST elevation. There's a classic, it's like tombstone pattern. And that's, it could be like, you know, in, it has to be two contigu uh, contiguous leads. You see that it could be like anteroceptal areas, this not much in lateral area. So it might be certain areas depending on the artery distribution of occlusion. You can see the pattern of ECGs. Uh, and they could be concave downward, they could be concave upward. So just imagine, have a picture of this ECG in your mind. But one sometimes difficult point comes along when you see J point elevation, ST elevation. So it starts with the, directly from the J point. Sometimes it can be confused with LVH. But definitely in clinical scenario, and look at that, still from baseline, there's at least more than two millimeter ST elevation of the J point. So this is, this is acute STEMI. In a particular situation, like in, in the situation when you look at in the ECG, you see tall R waves in V1, V2, and ST depression in V1, sometimes up to V3. Think about posterior MI, 
Okay, if a clinical scenario suggests, get a V7, V8, V9 leads. So you put the V9 leads at the left paraspinal area, V8 leads below the scapula, and in between V6 and V8, put the V7. And you can see that ST elevation in these leads. You don't want to miss this ST elevation. A lot of time we miss these patients with circumflex artery MI. Actually, they're having ST elevation MI, we miss it. So be careful to put these extra leads. Uh, another uh, example of ECG I'd like to share with you, when you see like diffuse ST depression, like inferior leads, anterolateral leads, but look at that AVR, there's a ST elevation. This type of patients, uh, you have to take it very seriously. If your patient comes with chest pain in the acute setting, and you see that ST depression uh, in inferior and anterolateral leads, but ST elevation in AVR, you always think about left main disease or left main equivalent like proximal, like LED going on. So you need to take these patients very seriously. I'll give you a different example, like similar situation you have, you have ST depression, you see that, anterolateral ST depression, you see that, and ST elevation you see in lead AVR. Is the patient having MI in the left main distribution or proximal LED? Look carefully on the ECG. Look at the small, tiny atrial activity, atrial activity. The patient is an atrial flutter, okay? So this ST elevation is not MI. This is due to atrial flutter. So always keep in mind, you have to always keep in mind your differential diagnosis. Make sure you don't miss those ECG and call for ST elevation MI because when you activate the team, it, it releases a cascade of procedures. You know, a lot of people involved, resources involved. You need to make sure you're right on calling the ST elevation MI. Another case scenario I'll give you that for example, like if the patient has an SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, nodal reentry, you can see some ST depression diffused. And also you can see ST elevation AVR. So similar pattern ST elevation AVR, but it's not true MI, not true STEMI. It is due to SVT, rapid heart rate. So these are the differences you need to keep in mind when you call for STEMI. So another difficulty we face in lead bundle branch block with the STEMI, if you are lucky enough to get a previous EKG, patient had old lead bundle branch block, then it's easier to diagnose. But in the acute clinical setting, if the patient has lead bundle branch block, and if the patient is really unstable, hypotensive, pulmonary edema, electrical instability, shocks, definitely it has to be, most likely it's MI, you need to take him to the cath lab as soon as possible. But there are certain criteria in uh, we call Escarboza criteria or modified Smith Escarboza criteria in diagnosis the diagnosis of stemin lead bundle branch block. Look at that. The, if they have concordant ST elevation, like ST elevation in the same way that R amplitude is, if it is in the lead bundle branch block, if there's more than normally we expect the ST. ST depressed here, okay? And here we expect ST upright, but if you have one millimeter ST elevation here, or in this lead, one millimeter ST down in V1 lead, then in lead bundle branch block, most like the patient having MI. Or any lead, like in a V1 lead, if you see more than five millimeter ST elevation, then there's a suggestion that is probably having an MI with underlying ST a lead bundle branch block. But I like the criteria more like modified smith scarborough criteria. And look at that. What we take it here from this baseline, we look at the ST elevation point and measure the distance. Like here in this particular case, 3.5 millimeter. And take the depth of the S wave is about 10.5 millimeter. You divide that 3.5 over 10.5. If it's more than 0.25 or 25%, likely the patient has not has been experiencing MI with underlying lead bundle branch block. In this situation, if you can, a bedside echo, because a lot of emergency room have it in, our, in this country, but it's, 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 if you're good, uh, you know, an echocardiogram, make sure you know, you just put the probe there, you can see all motion problem, then likely the patient having MI, if there's totally no all motion problem, 
patient having those symptoms, then then you you start think again what's something or it is just old late bundle branch block but nothing new going on. Uh, in, in very quick in STEMI protocol, as you know, that you have to be very quick in decision making process. Once you call STEMI, if, if you are PCA capable hospital, definitely you need to send the patient directly to cath lab. If the patient, uh, so if you're not a PCA capable hospital, then you have to look at the timing. Okay, how much time you can get the patient to the PCA capable hospital? It's more than 120 minutes. Then you start thinking about whether the patient is eligible for fibrinolytic therapy and go and give the fibrinolytic therapy. If not, then go and transfer the patient. Okay. And then in certain, certain group of patients that you give uh, fibrinolytic therapy and the patient has no perfusion, uh, you don't see ST resolution, patient's hemodynamically unstable, send the patient quickly uh, to the PCI capable center. Our other option could be if the patient's got the thrombolytic therapy and the patient's stable, then you, you still like to send the patients to the PCI capable hospital in between three to 24 hours. That's the current recommendation. I'm going to go details later on on that. But uh, let's look at the fibrinolytic therapy first. Initially started with, as we know, streptokinase and the first GC trial, it showed that mortality benefit compared to placebo, there's you know, 13% death in the control group and with the streptokinase group, 10.7%. This, this trial is important in one sense that it, it validated it validated the use of fibrinolytic therapy in acute MI setting first time, and it was published in 1986. And, this, and the GASTRO trial, GASTRO-1 trial, I just like to mention, this very old trial, definitely it compared streptokinase and sub-Q heparin, streptokinase with IV heparin, and TPA and streptokinase and IV heparin, and the accelerated form of TPA that you call, uh, they give the TPA 15 milligram uh, uh, bolus initially, and then 0 0.75 over 30 minutes, and then 0 0.5 milligram over an hour. That's in the 90 minutes protocol, because previously used to give streptokinase over three, hour, over three hours. That's the first uh, you know, study that validated that accelerated TPA protocol over 90 minutes. And as we see, Definitely, the accelerated protocol, the, the bottom graph, showed most benefit of 30-day mortality and stroke, okay? So, despite that there's slight increase, excess increase in hemorrhagic stroke with TPA plus heparin uh, compared to the other regimen, but the combined 30-day endpoint of death stroke was significantly lower in the accelerated TPA group. That is the you know, first trial that validated the use of accelerated TPA uh, over, over, you know, one and a half hours period instead of three hours period that we used to do before. Then there's multiple trials. I'm not going to go through detail, but I like to focus on the ASCENT trial because TNK trial, that's the fibrinolytic therapy we use the most in the United States. What it showed that it is equivalent with TPA, uh, in regards to mortality, we have the same percentage. Intracranial hemorrhage is about the same, 0.9%. Stroke is about the same. But what it did, TNK, it had better patency uh, of, of the resolution of the ST and, and revascularization uh, over patients presenting in four hours. And major bleeding was a little bit less. So, as, so let's look at that. What's the most benefit we get? When to give the TPA, we, we can get the most benefit. Yes, logically, we expect the most benefit when we have uh, still fresh thrombus, still not organized thrombus. So if you can give the TPA, sorry, fibrinolytic therapy in first hour of acute MI, that's the most benefit you get. As you see from the graph, after three hours, the benefit you know, the slope is very, pretty much horizontal, not much additional benefit you get after three hours. They definitely can't, you need to give it before 12 hours for sure, but the most benefit you get definitely in, on the first hour of treatment. So that's your target should be as soon as possible if you, if you decide to give thermolytic therapy 
uh, you need to give it as soon as possible uh, from the onset of symptoms. So this quick comparison of the different kind of thrombolytic therapy, as we know that patency rate is the highest probably uh, on the TNK uh, and compared to like streptokine is about 50, 60% most. But this, we still use in Bangladesh streptokinase and I believe that you are familiar with that. It's antigenic property, allergic reaction. You need to be careful with the patient had TPA before and uh, streptokinase before or have any allergic reaction before. And, uh, you know, main thing that, you know, it's definitely, uh, Estreptokinase doesn't have much fibrin specificity, but TNK has the most fibrin specific. So, so that's the most, uh, you know, one of the best, probably the thrombolytic therapy available. Uh, but during, uh, but concerning the situation in Bangladesh and affordability, I understand you're still using the streptokinase. And you need to know when you're thinking of giving thrombolytic therapy, you need to know what's the absolute and relative contraindications are. And you need to have it in your phone, you know, pocket somewhere. Because very quickly, you need to get this information before making decision whether the patient is eligible for TP or not. Any prior intracranial hemorrhage, any known structural cerebral vascular lesion, any metastatic disease in the brain, any ischemic stroke less than three months. Interesting enough, we give TPA thrombolytic therapy in ischemic stroke, but when it's acute stroke, definitely better in less than three hours if they present with the stroke, or now it's extended up to 4.5 hours. But in between this window, you cannot give that. After 4.5 hours, you shouldn't give that TPA. But uh, you know, if you suspect, as we had the first case I showed, aortic dissection, you don't want to give the TPA, you will kill the patient, okay? If there's active bleeding problem, building diathesis, you should give it. But you know, in women, if there's having periods, it's not a contraindication. If you have closed head trauma, if less than three months, you should give that TPA. There are some relative contraindications, the severe hypertension. Yes, you need to control the blood pressure better before you give the thrombolytic therapy. The cutoff point is 180 or 110. If the patient had prior ischemic stroke, less, less than three months, if, that, if, their CPR, if they had CPR more than 10 minutes, Traumatic CPR, you know, it's a relative country indication. Depending on the situation, you still could give it. But if PCA is available, you try to send him down there. It's a major surgery, less than three weeks. If there's internal bleeding uh, in between two to four weeks, there's also relative country indication. If they have any central line, like in subclavian line or something non compressible vasculature, you need to be careful giving the fibrinolytic therapy. Pregnancy is a relative country indication. If there's aptic Active peptic ulcer disease is a relative contraindication. The patient is on full anticoagulation like Coumadin or you know, having low NOx, full dose. You need to be careful. Uh, give, uh, there's an, you know, these are relative contraindication. And def definitely, in, particularly in the streptokinase case, if the patient had prior uh, streptokinase and allergic reactions, then you need to be careful about that. So not when you give fibrinolytic therapy, what other ad adjunct therapy you give? Definitely patient needs to be on aspirin. When the patient comes, has to have full dose aspirin and subsequent days would be like low dose in Bangladesh, probably 75 milligram. Here it's 81 milligram. We like to give P2Y12 inhibitor. If uh, we use clopidogrel with the fibrinolytic therapy, uh, if below 75, they have to have the loading dose, 300 milligram. If the patients go for PCI, we give 600 milligram. There's a difference there. Uh, if the patient is, Above 75 of age, do not give any loading dose of clopidogrel. Give only 75 milligram daily. So definitely from antiplatelet therapy, also they need anticoagulation therapy. Okay. And the old good friend is heparin still there. And in a fibrinolytic therapy, I think that's probably the best option. Uh, so uh, that we use, but you, you need to be careful. You need to be careful when you give uh, heparin uh, with family therapy because you use low intensity heparin. With the PCI, we do high intensity heparin. Uh, in, in, in the family therapy, we give 60 milligram per kilogram bolus. We shouldn't exceed more than 4,000 units. Then we have to use infusion about 12 units per kilogram, maximum 1,000 units initially. So, and we keep the 
PTT about one and a half and two times. Definitely you can use enoxaparin. Uh, if uh, less than, their protocol is a little bit different. If there's less than 75 age, you give 30 milligram bolus IV first. And after 15 minutes, you give one milligram per kilogram Q12. But if they are above 75, they don't need the bolus. And definitely you cut back the dose from one milligram per kilogram, you give 0 0.7.5 per kilogram sub QQ 12 hours. If there's kidney dysfunction, creatinine clearance less than 30, then you give only one milligram per kilogram every 24 hours. Some patients could be allergic to heparin. If they have HIT, you can use fondoparinix, uh, 2.5 milligram IV, and then 2.5 milligram daily. So these are the anticoagulant regimen used. Most commonly use heparin differently, but enoxaparin also could be used with fibrinolytic therapy. As we see, the efficacy of the fibrinolytic therapy, there's a 58,000 patients in nine randomized trial. Look at that, that patients needed to treat, like all patients definitely they benefited with the fibrinolytic therapy compared to placebo. If there's new bundle branch block, they benefited that. If the anterior MI, definitely they benefited that, fibrinolytic therapy. If in free MI, still benefited that, but ST depression, they did not benefit that, they did more harm. So fibrinolytic therapy never used in ST depression MI. Always be careful, it's not an indicator at all in ST depression. Let's do another case. A 68 year old man came to the ED, uh, but uh, the hospital does not have PCI capabilities, but he has substantial chest pain fluctuating over 18 hours. He has hypertension, history of intracranial bleeding, subarachnoid three years earlier, and also has self-limited diverticular bleeding because the patient did not have any procedure to stop that. His blood pressure is okay, heart rate is borderline high, and you see the EKG. And when you see the ECG, you see inferior ST elevation, there's some reciprocal depression there. Uh, sorry, excuse me, there could be more posterior involvement here. So when you, when you see that, ECG, you think about a STEMI going on. And, and you cannot transfer the patient to the PCI capable hospital because you know the patient has bleeding intracranial. So you probably would not, would not like to give that thrombolytic therapy. And, you don't, and the PCI capable hospital is more than 120 minutes away. So you have to do something. So in this choice, what are you going to choose? You gave him 325 of aspirin, you gave him Plavix, a clopidogrel. Are you going to give it? thrombolytic therapy on him, tenecteplas, reteplas, or even estreptokinase, give heparin, give voraxapar, it's a PAR1 inhibitor, or give efsiximab. So if you look at the patient, let's analyze the patient. The patient had intracranial hemorrhage, so he's not a candidate for thrombolytic therapy. And efsiximab, we mainly use in the cath lab, voraxapar is probably not a use here, but definitely, as we talked about that, as in guidelines and the data we have from the gastro trial, anything, anytime you give fibrinolytic therapy, there, they should have an injunctive anticoagulation. So the choice would be in this case that untraction or heparin. Despite the history of subarachnoid hemorrhage three years earlier, and patient is having acute STEMI, at least you need to heparinize them, and they should get the aspirin and plugs. So that's the current guidelines came out that any patients, uh, we talked about the guidelines with the uh, fibrillator therapy. Now let's talk about the primary PCI. What kind of anticoagulant to use? Definitely heparin probably the best choice here uh, because, and the dose is different. We talked about low intensity heparin with fibrillator therapy, but with PCI, we give high intensity heparin. That's a dose is 7,200 units per kilogram. If you if the patient is not on GP2B3 inhibitors. If it's without GP2B3 inhibitors, you have to give high dose, 7,200 units per kilogram bolus to achieve the therapeutic SCT. Normally it's 250 to 300 seconds. Uh, if the patient is allergic to heparin, if, if the patient has a history of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, you can give bivaluridin. And, but fundoparinix is not recommended in this patient because they have increased risk of thrombosis in the catheter. Let's look at the 
all the trials that we had compar comparison of the PCI and thrombolysis. And there's 23 trials, more than 707,000 people analyzed. As you see across the board, PCI was better. It improved death, improved non-fatal MI, improved recurrent ischemia and hemorrhagic risk. Stroke risk is really minuscule. And major bleed happened more. That's the only thing that was bad, but I'll talk about that. And definitely all combination together, PCO is better. The reason they had more hemorrhagic, uh, more major bleed because we do the procedure growing. Previously, the day, most of the data of uh, when they did the procedure through the groin uh, and a lot of uh, blood thinner involved, definitely they have more bleeding complications. But nowadays that we do radial approach, the bleeding is much less. So I believe this data will come down much smaller, but still across the board, we see primary PCI is better in acute STEMI compared to fibrinolytic therapy. And not only short-term data we have outcomes in 30 days data, but long-term outcomes also across the board is beneficial, primary PCI, both death and uh, non-fatal MI, recurrent ischemia across the board, primary PCI is better in the treatment of acute staining. So if you have to choose, you have to look at a few things, you know, with the fibrinolysis therapy and primary PCI, definitely, uh, Family therapy is available most of the time. Primary PCI is not, okay? Uh, if, even if it's available, but 50 to 60% of patients are only eligible for that. A lot of patients, you cannot give the TPA thrombolytic therapy to them. And their perfusion, reperfusion rate is low, 50 to 60% at the best. And the re reocclusion rate is also high, about 10 to 20%. And definitely there's risk of a stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, okay? But primary PCI definitely is not available everywhere, okay? But uh, uh, the reperfusion rate is high, more than 90%, okay? And, and the eligibility is definitely, uh, everybody can get the primary, at least get heart cath and, and, and shoot for primary PCI. So I'm going to uh, show you this slide. Like if you think that patient is, eligible for thrombolytic therapy. And, uh, if, if, uh, and then you have to think about that, what's the time interval the patient came with the symptom onset? If, is it less than three hours? Okay. And then you think about how much time you need to take him to the hospital. If it is in the same house, if you have the PCA capable, the patient is, needs to go to the PC cath lab right away. If in less than 120 minutes, you can transfer the patient to the other hospital to get the PCI, go and transfer the patient to the other hospital. You don't have to give the thrombolytic therapy. But if it is more than 120 minutes long and the patient presented in less than three hours of symptoms, go and give the thrombolytic therapy first and then transfer the patient to the other hospital to get the later uh, heart catheterization and possible revascularization, we call complete revascularization. But if, if the patient presents in between, after three hours, three to 12 hours, definitely 12 hours of the window, you know that, then maybe it's better uh, if the patient is, you can transfer the patient to PCI capable hospital or in-house PCI, go ahead and uh, send the patient for PCI. And if the patient is, if the hospital is more than 120 minutes away, then you might not give the thrombolytic therapy because we know that thrombolytic therapy benefits the most if it is in the first hour and, the, and the, after three hours, the benefit goes down. You don't want to probably take the extra risk of bleeding and go and send the patients, uh, transfer the patients through for primary PCI. The, this algorithm probably work better in our real world. If the patient definitely not eligible for fibrinolytic therapy, then trust the patient anyway. It doesn't matter what time interval it takes. So let's start with another case. A patient had history of DVT and the patient has pancreatic cancer. And a patient is planned for a pancreatic duodenectomy 
The patient presents to the emergency room with chest pain, nausea, diaphoresis. And the patient's already on blood thinner for the DVT. He gets full dose of uh, enoxaparine, 70 milligram, twice daily. Okay. And his physical exam, and he has JVD about 12 centimeters, so a little bit of heart, heart failure there. And let's look at that, the ECG. And we see that there's an ST elevation going on. So the patient having ST elevation MI. And what are you going to do on this patient? And you, you, you know that the patient uh, is PCA capable hospital and, and you are planning to do PCI. So you see that you do an angiogram and you see that patient's total proximal RC occlusion. Okay. So the reason I'm putting this case here, what treatment you're going to use? Uh, because the patients, you know, whether patient you want to give fibrinolytic therapy to this patient, or you need to do PCI with drag eluting stent, or do just simple balloon for the culprit region, and or surgical revascularization or bare metal stent. Imagine, look at that case on what he presented with. He had pancreatic cancer and he needed immediate surgery. So if you delay it too long, maybe his cancer is going to get far advanced and you'll have more problem. And at the same time, if you do just balloon angioplasty, reocclusion rate is very high. But if you do drag eluting stent on this patient, the patient needs to be on aspirin and Plavix. You know, we, we expect them to be on Plavix at least a year. So, but you cannot wait the surgery that long. So maybe it's not a bad idea to just put a bare metal stent and the patient can get the surgery done. Normally, we expect at least one month with the bare metal stent dual antiplatelet therapy, but probably after 14 days, patients can safely have the surgery done. Then, uh, uh, and his overall life expectancy with pancreatic cancer, if you can remove this uh, you know, obstruction, maybe you live uh, six months a year, so it will save him some time. And definitely he's not a good candidate for surgical revascularization with this you know, underlying clinical condition. So best answer probably to use bare metal stent for the culprit lesion. So when you use GP2B3 inhibitors in this type of patients, okay? And this is why for that, yes. uh, for that case, uh, surgical revascularization is not even indicated. They usually kill That it. is correct. <laughs> yes, I, I agree with that. <laughs> now I'm giving some scenario, real-time scenario, you know, uh, they can ask that whether you need to put drag eluting stent or bare metal stent. This is the case scenario, probably the bare metal stent would be better rather than simply angioplasty. And you know it better, you can comment on that later on, okay? Uh, so uh, let's talk about a few things that GP2B3 inhibitors, we don't use it much nowadays. Only, only there's a niche indication because a lot of trials, uh, we have the data on that. You only have large thrombus burden, you could use that. And if they have in inadequate P2Y12 receptor antagonist loading, only in that niche indication, we might use that GP2B3 inhibitors. And I'm going to go quickly. And, and another thing that when, when you think that you give that 5 limited therapy in a patient, in a PCA non-capable hospital, if the patient had failed fibrinolysis, that means you didn't have any ST resolution, high-risk patients, continued ischemia, definitely need to transfer the patient, okay? And we have enough data on that. Uh, okay, I'll show you the slide later on. Uh, so let's talk about few risk scoring when, you, when the patient comes with acute STEMI, because you need to know what's his likelihood to have 30-day mortality, because as we see, the team is scoring. Age is the greatest factor here always. And definitely systolic blood pressure less than 100. And if the patient is in shock situation, definitely very important. If the heart rate above 100. And particularly the clip class, clip, you know, two to four, it also gives you two points. When you add up those points, as many points you have, you see the mortality goes up. So this kind of idea to understand how the patient will behave during your hospitalization in and 30 days. So if you have more than three, you know it's already increased risk, 4.4%, okay? As, as, as the points piles up, then it goes, if you're all of eight, you have almost 35% mortality rate in 30 days. 
if, you, if they ask you questions like, what's the greatest risk in a patient post STEMI, age is the greatest risk, and particularly if age is above 75. So there are some, uh, you know, trial happened, CARES acute MI trial and transfer acute MI trial. It all showed when the patient's high risk patients, it's better to, even if you give thrombolytic therapy, better to transfer to the other hospital to get quick revascularization. This data we came, we got from the SCARES trial and transfer MI trial. And definitely- so, uh, Ismail, it is pertinent to say that in the US now, it is recommended that following lytics transfer, we used to wait and then, yes. uh, and now it is recommended that you just transfer the patient regardless. Of course, if the lytics fail, then it is a rescue PCI you have to, or there is any uh, complications. But one thing I wanted to point out, you nicely showed this TIMI risk score. Anybody interested in cardiology should note that this is a TIMI risk score for STEMI. There is a separate STEMI, yes. mm -hmm. risk score for non-STEMI. Don't, don't confuse this, please. This is a, this is a, there is actually a TIMI risk score for the STEMI as well. And you nicely showed that in both cases, the risk scores matter. Absolutely, absolutely. Now let's talk about, you know, the dual antiplatelet ther therapy. What's the guidelines we have? Definitely, if you have any stent, drug eluting stent, we prefer them to be aspirin and, and, and any dual antiplatelet therapy like clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticagrelor for 12 months. That's desirable. And, uh, but the aspirin dose should be at 81 milligram with that. And if the patient, uh, you know, there's other dual antiplatelet therapy available except for clopidogrel like prasugrel and ticagrelor. Definitely prasugrel, one point I'd like to make, if the patient had previous history of stroke or TIA, do not give prasugrel, okay? And it is not the loading dose that you can give in a patient, it's given in the cath lab or just immediately uh, the, the procedure. But Plavix, you can load that. And ticagrelor, you also can load that. That's the difference there. Ticagrelor is more effective in, uh, in reocclusion, re uh, but it has a little bit slight increased risk of bleeding. So you need to keep in mind. And also it has some side effects. Sometimes patient presence is short of breath, tired, fatigue feeling. But if you can talk to them, they get through that, they do better. But if they're really fatigued, tired, then you can change it to uh, clopidogrel. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a few things, another case. A 68-year-old female with acute anterior STEMI underwent drug eluting stent in proximal LED. Uh, the, in this case, I'm focusing how we are managing those patients, okay? The patients have got aspirin, clopidogrel, statin, metoprolol, blood pressure is okay. You did an echo, 40% EF, hypokinetic anterior wall, antiseptum apex, no other significant valvular disease. So what is the best next appropriate step? Because the reason I'm putting this case, because you know, whether they have low EF, whether they're going to put them on diuretic therapy, whether they put them on Entresto, or we call it Secubitril, Valsartan, Ivabradine, Lysinopril, Isosorbide. The, the reason I'm putting this case, because all of the patients with acute MI, and particularly if they have LV dysfunction, like 40% or less, they need to be on ACE inhibitor therapy. This is one of the classic trials that I grew up with. Actually, that time I was a student, I was doing blood pressure, reading on those patients. This Squib company did the trial, Captopril trial, and the SAFE trial, 1980s. And at uh, that time, uh, in, when I was in medical school, ACE inhibitor was contraindicated in heart failure, and particularly the post-MI, contraindicated. But this is the first trial that showed post-MI patients, LV dysfunction, that ACE inhibitor, they improve mortality. Not only that, they shrink the ventricular size, we call reverse remodeling. So patients have to be on ACE inhibitor therapy unless they do not tolerate. So as earlier as possible, you need to start ACE inhibitor therapy on this type of patient. Another case I'm showing as a management point of view, Patients come to our office. He had an MI about two months ago, STEMI, and got a drag eluting stent in the LED. And echocardiogram that time showed 30% EF with anterior apical echinosis that time. He's, he has been on aspirin, clopidogrel, statin, lysinopril. So he has the ACE inhibitor already on board. Metropolol ER, 25 milligram. Yes, it should be succinate when you treat any patient 
with heart failure. It should be not short acting. It should be long acting metoprolol. And his vital signs are okay. You do the labs, potassium is okay, 3.9. Creatinine is acceptable, 1.2. How we're going to treat these patients, okay? Patient, and you do an echo, okay? And you find there is an aneurysm there, anteriopical aneurysm. EF is 35, 5% improvement, not a whole lot. But you, uh, you had suspicion about that where there's a clot sitting there in the apex. You did a contrast study, definitive contrast we did. There is no thrombus, okay? So what are you going to do with these patients? Do you want to do surgical repair of the aneurysm? Do you need to start a spinal electron on these patients? Pericutinous repair of the aneurysm? You want to put them on warfarin because the chance of blood clot there because ap apex is dyskinetic or the new kind, new generation of NOAC like Epic 7 Let's answer this question because this is the most important thing I'd like to make because we are misusing this medication. Because the answer would be mineralocorticoid antagonist, pyranolactone. Where Where is the data came from? The RAILS study and April MI study, it shows that that despite that the patient has been on beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, and all the heart failure regimen post MI, adding the mineral corticoid antagonist improves survival. And this is the one of the medications that we use the least. But look at that, how much benefit we get from the from this medication. ACE inhibitor, you have to treat 26 patients to get one survival benefit. Beta blocker, you have to treat nine patients much better to, to, uh, to save one life. But look, look at the mineral corticoid antagonist, like aldosterone antagonist. You need to treat only six patients to get a benefit of one, one patient survival. This is the most beneficial medication and we are still underutilizing it. So any patient we have EF less than 40, heart failure, heart, uh, less than 40% 40, 40 post MI, or they have diabetes, and provided the patient's already on AC inhibitor, beta blocker, they should be on mineral corticoid antagonist to improve survival. Actually, we have seen tremendous improvement on the quality of life in this type of patients. With this, I'm going to stop the talk today and happy to answer questions. So um, that was a huge task. You probably covered uh, almost one third of cardiology in, yeah. the, in, in, in one hour. Uh, but I think the biggest challenge uh, for acute MI management is the recognition of the MI. Um, yes. And uh, we, I call it the mimics. That means some clinical state, it mimics like a myocardial infarction, but it is not, or it is important to recognize them so that we don't use the uh, poisonous drugs or mismanage the patients. These are the acute MI with uh, itself to recognize, then aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism, uh, pneumothorax, and then you make sure that this is not like a esophageal rupture perhaps. So these are the top five that you really need to tease out immediately. And, and for that, one of the important things that we have to, in the, our armamentarium is actually a careful history, physical exam, EKG, and a chest X-ray. And now widespread use of uh, handheld ultrasound can be of huge help. And the EKG mimics are very important from, from the LVH related ST elevation to Brugada to transient spasm to uh, mimics from the hyperkalemia, uh, rarely, you know, you can get it from pulmonary embolism, confusing lip bundle, pace rhythm, all these you need to, I call, uh, I tell the fellows that these are sh things that should be in the brain stem, not in the cerebral cortex. It's a reflex, but it is always important to emphasize the clinical presentation and tie this up with the EKG. In the European and American guidelines on this MI, and you now know the ESC criteria, the ST elevation is one thing, MI is another thing. So if you call it STEMI, you have to combine ST elevation with the MI part. I will um, bring up some questions because I was following 
some some questions in the chat line uh, and I did not answer because I was following the lecture, but I will leave the tough questions for uh, our speaker. I'll take the easy ones. <laughs> One question was important that can MI happen without thrombosis pathophysiologically? Remember that there are types of MI, very mm -hmm. critical to understand that plaque rupture, plaque erosion, activation of the coagulation cascade and the and the platelet activation, these are real deal type 1 MI. Many patients in the hospitals, particularly in the COVID time, you know that there may be demand supply mismatch and STL uh, and, and troponin rise. And don't confuse this, please, with the real deal MI. You may be giving the uh, poisonous drugs, anticoagulation, antiplatelets, unnecessarily in a high risk patients with end up with bleeding. Very, very important to differentiate the types of MI and understand the pathophysiology. Uh, and then another interesting question came out, and then I'm going to ask Dr. Hawk to answer some of the other questions. What immediately we need to know or do if we see that there is a symptom that is suggestive of MI? Uh, first of all, if any doubt, ask for medical help. We realize that from the symptom onset to in institution of therapy, if there is a delay, there is adverse outcome. So symptom to the clinical presentation is very important. And therefore we have placed this in the logistics called the first medical contact to the balloon time, FMC, because we really understand that whenever there is a medical contact, the system should pick up and, and, and institute the therapy. We talk about the TNK in the ascent too, but we did a study, remember, Cystriprokinase, it may be inferior, but it works uh, it in many works, patients. Works. When, and therefore, in the Nevada state, we did the study when there is no therapy, the mortality was really, really high, almost five, six times if you don't give any therapy. So this is very important that recognize and then institute the therapy, ask for help, and maybe one day we can develop a nationwide networking system where we can get a patient in the system, immediately recognize and institute therapy. As by the one other question came up, the, does statin therapy reduce infarct size? Uh, let, let me, yeah, uh, 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 let me explain to you uh, what statin does. Statin definitely is major effect in the acute setting, anti-inflammatory effect, okay? If we decrease the inflammation, and you decrease the propagate and improve endothelial cell function. And we can reduce the vulnerability of the plaque. Yes, in the if you in a second, we don't have like immediate decrease in infrared size, we don't have the data itself. But what we have, uh, you know, circumferential data that it can reduce if we don't do it, we have to compare that. If you do, don't do it, there's a possibility that, that the uh, propagation of thrombus could happen. Because uh, plaque is still vulnerable, is still releasing anti-inflammatory, uh, sorry, inflammatory things that can cause the cascade of the platelet aggregation, yep. and and, uh, and they can in increase the uh, infarct size because it affects only in the muscle microvasculature. You understand? When even if yep. you put stent, if you put stent, we improve the uh, patency of the flow, but some debris goes down uh, downstream. That sometimes we see we call it no reflow phenomenon. Okay, because the microvascular obstruction and all these things. But if a statin does help the endothelial cell function, I have a feel, I, I do believe that it will reduce if you could do real time comparison and real time uh, you know, uh, data on that uh, trials we, uh, in the micro level. We, we could probably say that yes, it will probably in some degree can reduce the size of the infrared or at least injury. Mm. It is interesting because following the uh, 80 milligram torvastatin data, we actually did a, a commentary mm -hmm. in clinical cardiology with mm -hmm. Michael Izikovic. Izikovic. If you're interested, you can see this. A, a very early administration of statin can be actually of help. Um, the, another one is the why aspirin is not recommended as primary prevention? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I know this is a kind of different scenario because uh, the reason being there's a lot of data recently came out and I, actually it was in publication newspaper and we got a lot of questions from the patients 
the, they did large trials. I think three trials came along over the last three years, uh, came out, published over the last three years. And it shows that if, the, if you do not have documented coronary artery disease or a stroke, document, despite that you have some risk factors, but you do not have any documented coronary artery disease, no stent placed, no angioplasty done, no stroke happened, then aspirin may cause bleeding more than benefiting you. That's the guidelines now we follow. Okay, so aspirin is not a recommended, like, like 10 years ago we used to give aspirin about 40 years old, everybody, you understand? That kind of dynamics has changed recently over the last, within four or five years. So if you don't have documented coronary artery disease, no stroke, yes, aspirin for primary prevention is not necessary because it causes more bleeding. And particularly people with age above 70. Sir, Dr. Maxipa, I have a question, sir. Uh, before I take the question, one thing that I'd like to ask you, I have some idea that I'm going to spread with you, okay? Uh, I, uh, the data came out from Dr. Uh, Abzalur Rahman from NICVD that in-house streptokinase storage really improves, uh, you know, short-term comorbidities, mortality, and also patency of the vessel. I'm not sure uh, whether our government has any proposal to do that, or if the government cannot do that, whether our physician community can help come together and get a fund all together from home, from abroad, all the physicians would be happy to participate to make a fund to at least generate uh, some funds to keep in-house streptokinase uh, for those patients in need. That's one thing. Second, definitely we need to develop some uh, protocol like STEMI protocol in Bangladesh. How you are going to refer these patients? That should be unified protocol for all over the country that from a primary care doctor who is, who is seeing the patient in the in rural clinic or somewhere, how quickly we can send the patients to PCI capable hospital or if not, how quickly they can access the streptokinase at least and then transfer the patient to PCA capable hospital. We need to develop a network. These two important philosophical questions I'm asking for our Bangladeshi community, our teachers, our, our you know, professors who are in authority. Uh, uh, if you need any help, we can help from abroad. But I think we need to generate these things in Bangladesh to save lives. So Azizbhai, just to let you know that we are trying to, to get an initiative uh, mm -hmm. on, you know, on behalf of the American College of Cardiology and, uh, and mm -hmm. Bangladesh, and Dr. Narula is also involved in developing a nationwide network. So we're in the, mm -hmm. in the dialogue process. Definitely, I'm going to include you, and then we'll see whether we can come up with a net nationwide network for mm -hmm. addressing uh, acute MI. We have yeah. to, okay? Now, now I'm ready for questions. questions. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, statin is a question. Statin is a question. If statin has anti-inflammatory effect, why don't we use the other anti-inflammatory drugs? Yes, uh, let me uh, explain that. As for example, like if you have a heart attack, when you have an acute myocardial injury, right? Uh, uh, what are the, uh, you know, action of those other anti-inflammatory drugs? Like as for example, ibuprofen and uh, other medications or, or steroids. There's all, there are also anti-inflammatory uh, uh, drugs, but they work different way. Okay, uh, what other uh, anti-inflammatory like NSAIDs, what they do, they prevent, uh, you know, healing of the myocardium. Okay, when they prevent the healing of the myocardium, they're damaging. So in acute MI, definitely, except for aspirin, we do not use any other NSAIDs. Even the patient has like post-MI pericarditis, like Dressler's, Dressler syndrome or immediate pericarditis post-MI. We do not use NSAIDs on those type of patients. We use high-dose aspirin. Okay, that's a different, we do never use steroids in post-MI patients with acute pericarditis because it's going to, uh, you know, hamper the healing of the myocardium will cause more damage, okay? But statin anti-inflammatory effect is different way they do it. They decrease the serine protease inhibitor, the metal proteinase that's inside the plaque, okay, that inhibits that, uh, ROS protein, they, they help to inhibit that. Those are the things uh, the beneficial effect of the statin and definitely endothelial cell, uh, endothelial, uh, they improve the endothelial cell dysfunction, they improve uh, significantly. There's nine effects of the statin. I worked with that in our vascular lab 
there's nine effects of statin is beneficial apart from the cholesterol lowering agents. The, the effect of statin anti-inflammatory is different than the enzymes. That's the reason we should I use would, that. I would label these as a pleiotrophic effect. Yes. To, to not correct. just mm -hmm. limit with anti-inflammatory to, to avoid confusion, the pleiotrophic and it's actually a huge role for the stabilization mm -hmm. of the plaque and not plaque. to have mm -hmm. it. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, next question is for Asan, sir. Uh, what is the role of the AVR in recognizing myocardial infarction and uh, how to distinguish between typical and atypical features of myocardial infarction? So the, the uh, atypical clinical presentations, uh, Neil, Linda Gillum from American Heart one time said that the females present with atypical features because you men, you don't recognize, you don't understand women. This is very important to understand that they can have angina equivalent, they may have dizziness, not quite the classic chest pain, 10 out of 10, sweaty, diaphoretic. But this is critical that we um, combine those symptoms with objective evidence of EKG and, and then biomarkers if possible, and then bedside ultrasound. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that, exactly the question, but I have a feeling that the, the questioner may be asking about typical versus the typical MI. I don't know, there is MI, the, the uh, this ESC and the SCC definitions, the type one, type two, type three, type four, five, five, then type one is the exclusively was the talk of Dr. Hawk today. We did not talk about the type 2 MI, which is a very important mixed bag. And in the type 1, we have this STEMI, and then we have the non-STEMI. And it is important that STEMI we recognize because it is very time sensitive. I'm sure non-STEMI also have time sensitivity, but timely delivery of care makes a difference in terms of morbidity and mortality following STEMI. And this talk today was exclusively addressing the STEMI and how to recognize and give therapy. Uh, thank you, sir. Our next question is for uh, Azizul Haq, sir. Sir, uh, is there any association of prognosis of myocardial infarction with systolic blood pressure? When should we give antihypertensive in acute MI and how long? Yes, very important. Actually, uh, there's a COMET trial and I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Uh, there's a tomorrow talk about uh, myocardial uh, uh, infarction complications. But briefly, I'm just letting you know that uh, the shock trial and COMET trial is very important. The, uh, the thing is that uh, you need to be careful not to drop the blood pressure too much, okay? As we know, the TIM is scoring in the STEMI. Uh, after the age, the low blood pressure, systolic blood pressure below 100 is, is a significant risk factor for long-term mort mortality. So when the patient is shocked, you know that mortality rate is pretty high, sometimes 50 to more than 50%. So you need to be very careful not to give any significant antihypertensive there. If the patient's blood pressure is borderline, we do not give ACE inhibitor on the first day. And uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we had in the guidelines to give IV metoprolol in acute MI, setting acute STEMI. We do not do that anymore because we have enough data right now that if you give IV metoprolol, uh, uh, then you can drop the blood pressure too much and the patient can go to uh, cardiogenic shock. So you need to be very careful. Uh, you need to keep the, uh, you know, don't give any extra medicine except for aspirin, statin, heparin, you know, uh, 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 clopidogrel, those type of medications you need to give. But if necessary, if the pressure is high, then you can use the ACE inhibitor low dose. But uh, if the pressure is like touchy, we call borderline pressure, do not use the ACE inhibitor on the first day. You have to wait at one or two days until the pressure stabilizes. Yes, that's correct. Uh, thank you, sir. We're, we are getting loads of questions. The next question is for Asan, sir. Sir, how early repolarization ECG differs from STMI? And in ECG of tachyarrhythmias, can we diagnose STMI? Okay, so uh, I forgot to answer that AVR question in the tachycardia. So in the stress lab, when we do the EKG stress test, the AVR ST elevation has less meaning compared to somebody coming with chest pain and AVR ST elevation. 
and in the tachyarrhythmia, as, as Dr. Hawk shown, in the presence of tachycardia, it is difficult to interpret the isolated AVR ST elevation, which otherwise in the emergency room can present when it is associated with diffuse ST depression in the precordial list, significant uh, left main or osteal LAD. So this is one important thing that AVR, pay attention to the AVR. But I always say this, always look at the patient and look at the clinical Absolutely. scenario and combine that, combine that with the, with the EKG. So what is the other question you said? Sir, the question is uh, how early repolarization ECG oh, first from STMI? Okay, so so the, the I would phrase this. There is a term in EKG world called early repolarization in the EKG. That is regardless of the phenomena that is happening in the acute MI. So early repolarization in a category of patients, you know, J-point elevation, we need to recognize because patient coming with you know, uh, chest pain and early depolarization abnormalities, it may confuse with the STEMI. But there is very early on the hyperacute T wave changes. We call it acute coronary insufficiency. And in the right clinical setting, it is important to recognize. Sometimes we see this, what they call the D winter sign with the proximal LAD and then the depolarization abnormality with biphasic T wave with Wallen sign. These are typical patterns in the EKG and in the correct clinical context that can be indicative of a significant coronary artery um, situ uh, stenosis. Uh, sir, um, almost in every session, we get COVID-related questions. Here we have got also one. Uh, this is for uh, Dr. Ajijul Hawk, sir. In severe to critical COVID cases, we are using steroids already. So if a patient develops new onset MI on background of COVID, should steroid be stopped or tapered? This is a very interesting question, okay? Because yes, uh, you know, high dose steroid is recommended, okay? Uh, you know, in this situation, we have some data in our institution. Uh, I can just share with you. First of all, you need to be very careful diagnosis, uh, diagnosis of MI in the COVID patients because COVID patients, they have some sort of myocardial involvement without MI and they have some troponin elevation, uh, you know, uh, some more than baseline. Probably sometimes we see about like five to uh, even sometimes 10. Uh, after 10, we see, and we did a heart catheterization, they have normal coronaries, okay? But if you have ST elevation MI, if you have ST elevation MI, then uh, definitely uh, patient should go for coronary intervention, okay? And, and the question right now is steroid tapering. Uh, I think it's probably reasonable to do that because patient already uh, had uh, myocardial injury and damage and uh, steroid definitely can hurt more uh, and uh, possibly sometimes it can cause myocardial rupture. So there's a possibility the patient may survive. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's catch 22, you know, you have to, make a decision on that. But and you know, I, I have a feeling of that is probably tapering the dose of steroid is not a bad idea. So, so, and uh, Dr. Asan can add on. that. Uh, I, I definitely want to jump on uh, because yes. uh, in the COVID time, it is important to recognize what part of the disease process we are in. If we are in the late stage, like beyond 10 days, then it is mainly inflammatory. We have a question in the in the chat box about the stroke and sometimes we see troponin, what you do. That is this, this is called this stress cardiomyopathy. We mm -hmm. see that it's injury pattern and troponin rise. There are mainly three pathways. There is a recent Jack uh, Journal of American College of Cardiology publications that defines these three pathways. One is the sympathetic surge pathway. One is the inflammatory path, uh, surge pathway and also the, the, the histamine release pathway but or, or serotonin release pathway. But remember in the COVID time, there's inflammatory pathway and we see the troponin. These are not the, the MI that we know. These are the myocardial injury. And in this case, if it is a late presentation, actually those patients with high inflammatory markers and an IL-6 high, the tocilizumab and steroids are actually indicated. You don't. Yeah, yes, if it is. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is stunning. And, and this is, there is a lot of 
theory there that is it really myocarditis? It's probably not. Probably these are in tandem working with the TM, PR, SS pathway and the S pathway. And if you can reverse the anti-inflammation, then the cardiomyopathy get better. We have plenty of experience and, and we have actually published cases on this. And, and, and interestingly, there are some publication report from Bangladesh where uh, I can tell you that Dr. Momen sent me one case fascinating that they use the tocilizumab and the steroids and the late COVID surge inflammatory, this cardiomyopathy got better. So it is very, very important to understand what is the underlying pathophysiologic basis of the MI. Is it just the injury troponin or is it the uh, type two ARDS hypoxia MI or is it type one classic MI where the treatment modalities may significantly vary? I, and I'd, I'd like to make a comment on that. Uh, that. I totally agree with that because most of the time with COVID, we see intracoronary thrombosis, okay, or inflammation of the myocardium itself. So that's a different MI, okay? That's not plaque rupture. It's a plaque rupture acute STEMI, the treatment is different than not plaque rupture, uh, you know, MI in this COVID patients. So in, in non-plaque non rupture MI in COVID patients, inflammatory COVID patients, definitely steroid is indicated. The steroid should not hold. I, I totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, uh, sir, uh, uh, we have questions. Uh, we are getting a lot of questions. Uh, there is regarding management. Is there a relation between biotin supplements and troponin? Uh, I do not have the data, honestly, on that, okay, biotin supplementation. Uh, I have to look at it myself, but I don't think so. There's a direct connection on that as far as I remember. But Dr. Hassan, if you have any information on that. Actually, I would like to refer to a recent uh, Jack uh -huh. article uh -huh. on supplements in cardiovascular uh -huh. diseases. In the acute setting, they have not talked about anything. In the preventing setting, preventive aspects, they have talked about this. I, I, yes, I don't mm -hmm. think that I've seen anything, you know. In the acute setting, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then what is the difference between troponin I and troponin T? Uh, this is well, it's just more specific. Uh, I think most of the area nowadays we are using troponin I. Uh, uh, so uh, I think initially when we started uh, the biomarker uh, analysis, troponin T was available. But now we are very specific, uh, and we got some more data that troponin I releases earlier, and is more specific to the myocardial injury than the troponin T. So most of the labs are now uh, using troponin I. Uh, would you please uh, briefly tell about high sensitive troponin? Uh, this is basically the same thing. You know, uh, the test, the test you do, and what's the reference values that you have in your lab. That also is very important to understand that. Okay, it's like the way the technology they use uh, to detect the troponin. I think this troponin fifth generation high sensitive is, yeah. is causing big trouble across US. Yeah, because they're very sensitive. <laughs> Soon you will be getting this trouble as well um, because the temporal change is more important. Temporal change yes. mm -hmm. because this is like the and the data is like. We talk about 0.1, so it is you you multiply by that by by thousand. But the issue is, and when you get the new sense high sensitive troponin, you divide them by thousand because there is a good correlation that you can think about that in the old way. But main issue is: is it 20 percent, 30 percent rise, or is it the same troponin level? That's one thing. And the second thing is the absolute value, but more importantly, as a clinician and Dr. Hawk, as is why you have done is very well that the clinical context is more important than absolutely mm -hmm. just go by the troponin. There is a number of things that can give rise to troponin. Is it the uh, demand supply mismatch, or is it somebody Long hitting things, on the yeah. chest and direct trauma, or is it sepsis, or is it severe anemia, or is it renal failure? The, we have as clinicians a bigger job now to interpret these troponins rather than jump on it and call it an MI and cause havoc uh, in the clinical system. 
Uh, yeah, I'd like to make a point, as uh, Dr. Chaudhary mentioned, that uh, look at the type of MI. It's very important. Like there's five types of MI. Look at that, and it's very important. Most of the MI will fall into the category of type 2. Okay? So you need to understand better. You need to really relate to the clinical context of that. Because we are worried about more type 1 MI when you have plaque rupture. That's the MI, then you need to be very aggressive. And others, you know, you look at that, you will always probably find a secondary cause, okay? There's another one we call Minoka, okay? <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I, like, I refer you to read about five types of MI. That's very important for your clinical practice. And, and I think you'll do better when, when you analyze those patients, what to do with this troponin, like <laughs> borderline troponin. That's why it is okay? fair to say that sometimes we mm -hmm. go by the binary definition that troponin positive, am I troponin negative, not am I. That mindset should change. And the Change absolute this. value matters. So if you do the troponin more than 100, the differential diagnosis of that high level of troponin becomes very narrow. And we did a study also that when the troponin is 5, I'm talking about the old methods, not the eye sensitive. Above 5 in the clinical setting of uh, acute illnesses, there is more likely you may see high-grade obstructive lesions. But there is no fixed rule. And one thing that I would like to make a comment on that for our young physicians, get the habit to really analyze that because don't put everybody in the, in the note, progress note or in your hi clinical history that patient had non-STEMI. Non-STEMI is a different diagnosis, okay? So you need to write down elevated troponin or type 2 or type 3, not non-STEMI. If it's non-STEMI or STEMI, is due to plaque rupture. You understand that? That makes a huge difference in the registry of the patients in the, in the acute MI case. So uh, be careful how you're writing in your diagnosis that you write down elevation type two, a, a troponin elevation, not due to plaque rupture. You need to be very specific about that when you're writing your diagnosis. It's a big problem, Arizvai, because- Yes, I know, I know that. In the registry, then we get dinged, yes. blamed unnecessarily mm -hmm. for, for these kind of issues. And it causes a big trouble as we participate in the database. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, sir. What a fantastic presentation it was. Wish I could pick all the questions asked, but uh, due to time constraints, I cannot go through all the questions. Uh, I would like to hand over uh, uh, to uh, Jodhuri Hassan, sir, to make a conclude, a concluding uh, speech. And uh, so if sir would like to add something or answer any question he went through, it would be very beneficial for us. And, uh, I from actually my side, want to thank... Uh... Um, Dr. Azizul Haq, because, you know, that was, as I said, that is why you covered one third of cardiology in such a good way that uh, it was like a, listening to a story. Um, and I really thank you for that. Uh, and definitely we like to collaborate. Uh, and, and the most important thing is that this kind of program is successful because of the participants, the attendees. It is successful because you came. And I thank you, the organizers. Thanks. Thank you very much for helping me. Thank you.